Good morning, everybody. This is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday Minor Prophet Study. We're in Amos chapter 3 and verse 11 is where we're going to be starting today. If you would bow your heads and let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we praise you and glorify you and thank you for all you do for us. We're thankful, Father, for the information that you have recorded for us about your activity in the world and about your dealings with people so that we might, Father, be able to uh, know uh, how you are so that we might find favor in your sight. We pray that you would look down upon us because you know who we are. You know what kind of people we are. And we pray, Father, that you help us to always glorify you, to always serve you. We pray for those that are sick, as we mentioned, uh, Elaine and Don and uh, others who are having uh, trouble in the flesh, uh, Rosalind. We pray, Father, that you would just bless them and bring them back and others that we might not know about. Pray that you would heal them and, and bring them back to their health. Uh, and we pray, Father, that you help us with your Holy Spirit as we try to glean information from uh, Amos the prophet. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So like I mentioned, we're in Amos chapter 3 and verse 11, and we're in the first of the three, ser of the three sermons that are given to uh, Israel. And remember that the first uh, two chapters uh, dealt with uh, seven judgments that God gave. Uh, uh, five of them had to do with the Gentile nations, uh, Damascus, Geza, Tyre, Edom, and Ammon, and Moab. And then in uh, chapter 2 and verse five, 4 and 5, or, uh, he dealt with Judah. And then the, the biggest part of that, uh, those eight judgments was to Israel in chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Then in chapter, in chapter 3, verse 1, he started his first sermon uh, towards Israel, and we got down to verse 11, where he's talking to them about the fact that they deserve this, this judgment that's coming. Uh, and he pointed out, uh, really in verses 1 through 10, that they should be listening. And he gave them a bunch of rhetorical questions uh, to get them to understand that they should react in a certain way when God's prophet is preaching to them instead of them not doing what God says. And so in chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your, your strength from you, and your citadels will be rooted, or sorry, looted. Uh, thus says the Lord, just as a shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of uh, legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwell in Samaria, a dwelling in Samaria, be snatched away with the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. Uh, hear and testify against the house of Jacob declares the, the Lord God, the house of the God of hosts. For on the day that I punish Israel's transgressions, I will also punish the altar of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. The, the houses of ivory will also perish, and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. So as uh, God continues, or through Amos, this this um, sermon against Israel, uh, he points out in verse in verse 11 that because they're not listening to God and because they're not following God, he's going to cause them to be looted. And of course, remember that in our, in our uh, lesson here, we're talking about Assyria, who is over here, and Assyria is the one who is, in, who is vying for power at this time, and that's when Amos is preaching, and Amos is preaching during the time of, let me get this over so we can see, whoops, uh, Amos is preaching during the time over here of uh, 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 Jeroboam, and, and that's where he's preaching, uh, also during the time of uh, Hezekiah. And so he's preaching during that time, especially to the, to the northern group, and he's telling them that they're going to go off into captivity. And remember that uh, though Amos is preaching over here uh, around 760, uh, around there, the fall doesn't happen until around 700. Uh, uh, 722 BC, and so there's a number of years that God is giving them in order to repent. So remember that as you read this. I know a lot of times we read these things and we think, well, God is being mean. Well, no, if God wanted to judge them and destroy them, he'd just do it with a blink of his eye if he wanted to. The fact that he's sending prophets indicates that he loves them, cares for them, and wants them to repent and give it an opportunity to change. And so in verse 11, he says that basically Assyria, that the enemy is going gonna, is gonna to surround the land and pull down the, their, their strength, uh, and, and that, that basically means to defeat their, their army. Uh, 
uh, and your citadels will be looted. In other words, their their fortresses, though those um, um, uh, those armories that they have that are supposed to protect them, they're going to be destroyed, and everything is going to be taken from them. And in verse 12, he says, Thus says the Lord, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away with the corner of a, of a bed and the cover of a couch. Now, there's a, a couple of sentences, sentences in here that we might not be familiar with. Uh, he says that, uh, uh, in verse 12, he says, Just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of uh, legs or a piece of an ear. What does that mean? Besides the literal fact that it says a shepherd does that. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to say protecting the rest of the flock. Okay, the rest of the flock? They're getting eaten. He, he, shepherds have to give an account of their sheep. And if a sheep gets torn by a, a lion or a wolf or something, they have to go find the carcass and bring back an ear or bring back a leg or bring back something that shows that it was eaten. And that's this idea that he says here, he's going to deliver them. There's only going to be a, 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 a couple of legs or a, a piece of an ear. In other words, when, when you look at Israel, the, the northern tribes later, we notice that their demographics change and they become known as Samaria. Uh, this area here becomes known as Samaria. And that's and, and one of the reasons that, that they're uh, despised so much by the Jews of their time was why? Why were they despised so much by the Jews of their time? Why didn't, why didn't anybody like the woman at the well? She was a Samaritan, right? But, but why didn't they like her? Mixed races, there you go. So there were some Israelites that were left in here, but they were so few that they had to intermarry with the with the Assyrians that were sent here to live, and so therefore they kind of they lost their identity, even though they sent them back a, a, a priest to teach them. He taught them the way that they had been living, which wasn't right, but yet there were some who, who were, in, in essence, trying to, trying to serve God. And so that, that's what he means here when he talks about the fact that, that there's just going to be a, a piece of them left. There's not going to be enough for them to even be identified as a nation. And so he says, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away with the corner of the bed and the cover of a couch. Uh, anybody have any idea what that means? Good, I, I was glad that nobody else was as dumb as I am. Because uh, the only thing I can get the, that I've been able to find out about this is the idea of, of uh, the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch has to do with the the most important parts in a rich person's furniture is what's under consideration there. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of, of people in the, in the Middle East uh, or in third world countries that have couches. Couches is what you lay on, you know, and you get kind of relax and you recline. Yes. Oh, there you go. All right. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Yeah. So, so I believe when he talks about the corner of the bed and the cover of the couch, he's talking about uh, rich people's furniture, and he says they're, that's going to be taken off into captivity. In other words, when, when an invading army comes, do they take the junk? What do they take? They take the best stuff, right? So they'll take your expensive furniture, and they'll take all your stuff, and that's what they're going to take. And that's what he's pointing out here. And so they're going to leave an ear and a remnant. They're just going to leave a little part is what they're going to leave. And so he says in verse 13, Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the, the God of hosts. So God is telling Amos to testify against these people. And this isn't the first time God's doing this. He sent them a number of prophets, and they haven't been listening. And so he tells them to testify against them. So uh, they're supposed to be God's people. They were basically relying on the fact that they were blood relatives of, of Jacob and of Abraham and Isaac and those individuals, but that doesn't do them any good. If they're not doing what God wants them to do, then they're going to be carried off into captivity. And the Bible tells us that, that God's judgment when he comes is going to start with the house of God. The judgment's going to start with the house of God. We're not going to get away from judgment 
we're going to be judged just like the rest of the world. But hopefully if you're in Jesus and you're doing what's right, then Jesus is the one who has paid the price for any sins we may have committed. But we are going to be judged, and it's going to start with us. And so that's what you, that's what you have going on here. Verse 14, for on the day that I punish Israel's transgressions, I will also punish the altar of Bethel, and the horns of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. In other words, what he's saying by that is, if their God, who, who was the God that they set up over here in Bethel and in Dan, if, those, if that God was able to save them, they wouldn't be able to go in and conquer them. But since they went in and conquered them, he's bringing judgment on their God. He's bringing judgment on what they believe. And that's the idea that he's putting out here. And I'm sure that the, the, the altar was destroyed when, when uh, Assyria invaded, but it's not just the physical destruction of the, alt, of the altar of Bethel, but it is, it is the idea that their uh, God let them down, which is really which really is not another god. And so uh, that's what he means when he says, and the horns of the altar will be cut off. The horns represent the strength of the altar, the, the power of the altar. Uh, that's why when they made the, the um, um, altar of, of burnt offering, they had corners that had like horns that would come up, and those horns represented, represented power. Uh, and that's what's under consideration here. So, so God's going to destroy their, their religion, and he's going to uh, defeat them, and they should learn something, right? Now, verse 15, uh, I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. The houses of ivory will also perish, and the great houses will come to an end. So basically, he says he's going to take care of their winter houses and their summer houses. So what does that tell you about the people? They were rich, and so they were able to have two houses, one for the winter you know, when it's, when it's uh, uh, um, cold in the mountains, uh, they could go down to their summer house. When it's hot in the summer, they go up to their cool house. Uh, and so God says, but all of that's going to perish. And the houses of ivory would, would represent the king's uh, palace because his, his palace was one of ivory. Uh, and it says, and the houses of ivory will perish and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. So God's going to bring judgment. Uh, this chapter is mainly judgment on the ruling um, men or the ruling group, but he doesn't just stop with there. In chapter 4, we have his second sermon, and the second sermon deals mainly with the uh, rich ladies, uh, the, the wealthy ladies. And it says in Amos chapter 4 and verse 1, here, here's the second sermon. He says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their, your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord has, has sworn by his holiness, behold, days are coming upon you when they will take uh, you away with meat hooks and the, and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through breaches in the walls, eat, uh, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to uh, Harmon, declares the Lord. Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your, your tithings every three days. Offer a thanks offering also from, uh, from that which is uh, leavened, uh, and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. And so as he talks about the women, he, he doesn't picture them as favorable. Now, this always reminds me of, it, you know, if you watch television at all, uh, you see uh, um, uh, some, of the, some of the show titles that they have for, for, for various um, um, series that they have, uh, like uh, there's uh, uh, house, Housewives of, of something or other, and it's like the really, really uh, expensive men who, and their wives and what their wives do while their husbands are out making a bunch of money, uh, and, and so you have all of these, and people like like watching those in the world and they like seeing what everybody has. God's talking about those kind of people. And so as he, as he talks here, he says, hear, hear this, you cows of Bashan. Now, Bashan was not in Israel. Bashan was over here in this area. And if you remember over here in this area, why, why was it that the children of Israel, like Gad uh, and Manasseh, wanted to stay on this side of the Jordan? Why did they want to stay there? It was, it was good grazing ground. So the, so the cattle that are over here 
They're fat. That's the kind of cattle you want to eat, right? You want to eat the fat ones that have some fat on them, and so they're, they're, they're fat. And that's what he's talking about when he says, you cows of Bashan. Now, it's interesting that he says cows and not sheep, uh, because cows and sheep really don't graze together very well. And the reason for that is because cows eat the grass on top, sheep actually pull up the roots. So if the sheep are eating, they'll kind of pull up the roots. And so it, it, it takes a while for the, till the next year for them to grow. Whereas a cow can eat some of the grass on top, like, your, like when you mow your lawn. You don't mow your lawn once a year, right? You, you mow your lawn like every two weeks. Well, if the sheep go through, they, you, you wouldn't have to mow your lawn for a year. Uh, is basically what's under consideration. So when he calls them the cows of Bashan, he's not giving them a compliment. He, he's, he's telling them that they're like these fat cows that just eat everything up, okay, whenever it grows up. Uh, and he says, and he says, who oppress the poor. See, they're concerned, of, uh, uh, they're not concerned about the poor. Who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. In other words, uh, they're just materialistic. All they want is for themselves, right? And so when you watch some of these like Hollywood uh, shows or like the Oscars or anything like that, uh, do, do the women dress in a pair of Levi's and a, and a um, flannel shirt? No. What do they, what do they wear? Oh, they wear, you know, their clothes cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Okay. And yet there's poor people and, and, and they have one dress that costs, you know, $50,000 and yet, do they give $50,000 to the poor? I don't know. Maybe some of them do. But I doubt very seriously if very many of them do. And that's what he means when he says, bring now that we may drink. In other words, we're going to consume stuff. We're, we're going to consume stuff all the time. In verse 2, he says, uh, the Lord God has shown by his holiness. Behold, days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and, uh, and the last of you with fish hooks. One of the things that Assyria did when they would conquer a nation is they would take them, uh, it's the wrong way, is they would take them to live in their land. And the way they would do that is those people that were taken, they would either put a hook in their cheek or a hook in their nose and tie them on a big rope and would lead them all out so that they wouldn't run away. And that's what he's saying. So they're, so they're going from sprawling out on their couches and you know eating wonderful food and drinking wine to being drug off as, as um, uh, slaves. And, and no doubt when they, when they get there, they're going to be abused because they're the fancy women. They're the elite women uh, that are under consideration. Verse 3, he says, You will go out through the breaches in the wall, each one straight before her, and you will, and you will be cast uh, to Harmon, declares the Lord. When he says you're going to go straight out, it means that all your walls in your city have been destroyed. So you don't have to go through the gate to get out of the city. Your, 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 your protection is gone. So you, you're just going to walk up across a bunch of rubble, and, and you're going to be carried away captive because you're going to be destroyed. Now, uh, nobody's been able to know what, ex what ex exactly means when he says Harmon. could be the name of a city, uh, although, although we're not sure what, what city it is or where it's, where it's found. Uh, haven't been able to find anything, but basically... It, it means that they're going to be carried off into captivity, like I told you. And so, the, so the, 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 is, the Israelites, the ten northern tribes, are going to be carried off over here to this area over here. That's where they're going to be carried off. And so it's probably referring to that area over there where they're going to be carried off to. Verse 4, he says, Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithe every three days. Now, now you hear the, the prophet is being sarcastic. He's saying, you guys trust in, in Bethel. You guys trust in that false god. That's who you trust. So go trust in him. If that's who you trusted, go trust in him. Uh, go, go and multiply transgressions. Go and take your sacrifice every morning. Go and give me your tithe every three days. Offer thanks offering uh, for that which is lab. Uh, I'm sorry. And offer thanks offerings also from that which is leavened. Are they, in Israel, are they supposed to, I'm sorry, in Judah at the temple, are they supposed to offer sacrifices with leaven? No, but here they are. So he's talking about their false religion. He's talking about their false dependence on Bethel and their false dependence on Dan. He's talking about, he's talking about that and telling them, well, go ahead and do it. If you think they're going to save you, if you think they're going to keep you from this, well, go ahead. Go ahead and, and, and enter into that false worship. 
And so here's, here's an interesting thing because one of the things that he showed us is a contrast between religion and what, what God expects them to do. In verse 1, he told them what he expects them to do, that they're not doing. He says they oppress the poor, they crush the needy, they're greedy. That's not what they're supposed to do. If you, if you go to, to a religion and they're teaching you the prosperity gospel, the more you give to God, the more he'll bless you. The more money you give him, the more money you'll make. You know, if you do that, then you're going to be blessed and you're going to have everything you want. Then you, you, you ought to run from there because that's not the message of the gospel. That's not the message of Jesus. It's, it's not one of take, take, take. It's one of the joy bus. You know why it's called the joy bus, right? Jesus first, others second, and you last. That's, that's what it means to be one of God's people. And so God is, is going to take them away, even though they're offering these drink offerings and even though they're, they're offering their free will offerings. Uh, so, they're, so they're spending a lot of money in religion, but they're not helping the poor. They're not helping those who are oppressed. They're not helping those who, who are needy. Okay, uh, And so he's, he's addressing the women here. Now, uh, verse 6, he says, But I give you also cleanness of teeth. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there was still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and uh, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the while uh, the part not rained on uh, would would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. God said, Amos isn't my first warning to you guys. Amos isn't the first guy to come and preach to you. God says that I have basically, God has been trying to get their attention through the natural course of nature. Remember that during this time, uh, in, in over here in Israel, the, the way that Israel was watered was not through irrigation. The way Israel was watered was through uh, God's care and through the seasons. God would make it rain. It'd bring the early rain, then it'd bring the latter rain. It'd bring the rain when you first plant your seed, then you bring the rain in order for them to develop and grow. And so it was, it was by rain. What's interesting is Michael is over here in Jordan, and he sent us some photos from Jordan over here where he's at. And you remember I told you that this area over here was considered lush and for you to be able to raise cattle? Uh, he was in a helicopter and he was filming some of, the, some of the stuff he was looking at. It was all barren. The only place that had water or the only place that had greenery was where they irrigated. That's not the way it used to be. They didn't have, those, they didn't have that big irrigation, but because of sin... That's why they have the condition that they have, and that's why Israel is the way it is. But uh, at this time, God would cause it to rain. So he says, look, I have tried to warn you by the, the, the things that are being done naturally. He says, I've given you clean teeth. When do you have clean teeth? When you don't eat. When you don't have anything to eat, your teeth are clean. And he says, and in all your cities, and lack of bread in all your, in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. He says, I've done these natural things to try to get you to turn to me, but you're not turning to me. That's one of the things I hope you notice as we're going through Genesis chapter 1, that all the things that God created, he created to get you to think of him. Not just look at what he's done for us, but how marvelous and how wonderful the creator is who designed all these things that keeps our world going and that gives us everything that we need, how marvelous he is. And so here, when, when they have cleanness of teeth, they don't pay attention. Now, uh, who worries about inflation? Who generally worries about inflation? The rich people or the poor people? The poor people, right? Uh, and, and that's why when, when somebody gets in power to, to control our economy and the inflation goes up, they act like, no. There's no inflation. Well, that's because they're like billionaires. It doesn't bother them, but it bothers those who are, in fact, uh, in the middle class or those who are poor. And he says, furthermore, I will, I will withheld the rain from you while, while there were still three months until harvest. 
So the, so the rain that they would usually get, God says, nope, no rain for you. And he says, then I would send rain on one city, uh, and on another city I would not send rain. So one, so one group or one area would get rained on, and so all the people run over there because they have food. Uh, and then the, the next year, another area would have uh, would have rain and they'd all run over there and that's basically what he's saying here and, and he says that then I would send rain on one city and uh, and on another city I would not send rain one part would be rained on while the other not rained on would dry up and so he says God is is giving them rain just barely enough to keep them alive as a group of people you might say and rather than them listening they don't listen verse 8 he says so two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water but would not be satisfied. Yet, you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. That's the second time he said that in this statement. The purpose for them is to bring, is for God to come, or for them to recognize God and recognize what they're doing. So whenever anything goes wrong in our family or, or any problems we have, the first thing we need to look at is, am I doing what God says? That's the first thing we ought to look at. And then if you can honestly say, well, I think I'm doing okay, then you look for other reasons why those conditions might be happening. So, verse 10, he says, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword uh, along with your, captive, uh, your captured ho uh, horses, and I made the, the stench of your camp rise up uh, in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. He says, your army is getting defeated. That's what he means by the young men. He says, your, your young men are getting defeated. And the horses that you went and got, they're, they're being destroyed too. Now, was, was Israel supposed to have a lot of horses? When they went into the land, was the king supposed to acquire a lot of horses? No. They were not allowed to have horses. Why not? Why didn't God want them to have horses? because they would trust on the horses instead of trusting on God, because horses were considered the ultimate war weapon of their day. We're going to talk about that in our sermon today. But they're, they're the ultimate war weapon in their day. If you had a horse and you had a sword or a spear, man, you'd go through and take care of everybody uh, that you're fighting against. But they're going to be destroyed, and they're going to be captured. And, and he says, and I made the stench uh, of your camp rise up uh, in your nostrils. In other words, there's going to be all these dead guys laying around. He says, but... You don't return to me. He says, you don't come back to me. It's kind of like 9-11. When 9-11 happened, what happened in, in the churches? Oh, they got all full. All the preachers were going, man, I'm a good preacher. Right? And then what happened six months later? Went back to their normal levels. <laughs> yep. So, uh, he says, you don't return to me. Verse 11. He says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. He says, you're like Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because they were wicked. That's why he destroyed them. He destroyed them because there wasn't enough righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah to spare the city. So apparently there's not enough righteous people in Israel. They're supposed to be God's people. There's not enough righteous people in Israel for God to spare them, the 10 northern tribes. Now, verse uh, 12, Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So he says, because this is going to happen, what does Israel need to do? Well, they need to repent. He says, if you're not going to repent, well, then get your army together. Get all your soldiers together because I'm going to fight against you. So prepare yourself for battle. Now, are they going to beat God? No. Here, here's the proof of them not beating God. Well, I can use this one. What happened to Israel? They went off into captivity. So when God <laughs> says something, are you going to be able to beat him? Are you going to be able to change it? No. Verse 13. He says, for behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and, and, and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. So why, why, are they, why should they listen to God? <coughs> oh, 
Okay, because he can either protect them or destroy them because God is God. That's why you listen to him, because he's God. Now, if you're thinking of God from the standpoint of like the spiritual world, somebody might say, well, that's why I listen to Satan. Why shouldn't you listen to Satan? Because he doesn't care about you. See, one of the reasons that we listen to God isn't just because he's God. But it's because he's a God who's a loving God, a kind God, a gracious God, a God, a, a, a God who wants to save us and deliver us. He, he's a God who wants to bless us. That, that's the kind of God he is. I guarantee you if he was a mean, uh, terrible God, we might serve him out of fear, but we're not going to serve him because we love him. We serve God because he's God and he's the one who created the world. He's the one who made everything. He's the one who blesses us. Who else should you serve? Who else should you follow? Should you follow the gods of Bashan or, or of Bethel? Should you follow these gods and the, and the god of, of Dan up here that they set? Uh, how good did that, that god protect them? How good did the gods of Egypt protect Egypt when Israel was delivered? Didn't. So how good are the gods that people set up today going to deliver them? Not going to. And that's the point that he's making. Now, he comes to his third sermon to Israel, which takes up two chapters. It begins in chapter 5 and goes to chapter 6, and it starts off like this. Hear this word, which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen. She will not rise again. The virgin Israel. She lies neglected on her, uh, on her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city which goes forth as a thousand strong will have a hundred left. And the one who goes forth as a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus, says the Lord, for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live, but do not resort to Bethel and do not go to Gilgal nor cross over to Beersheba, for, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. He says, Seek the Lord that you may live, or he will break forth like a fire, O house of, of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench it for, uh, uh, for Bethel. He says, For thus... Uh, for those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the, to the earth, he who made the, the Pleiades and Orion and, and changes deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night, who calls for waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. So let's take a look at those eight verses. We have a few minutes. Let's take a look at those and see if we can't cover some of those. So he says in verse 1, he says, hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. So he's saying, here's, here's a, a song that's going to be sung that's going to be sad about Israel. He says, she has fallen. She will, she will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she uh, lies neglected on her land. Uh, there is none to raise her up. Now, here's what I want you to remember. When he talks about Israel falling, when he talks about Israel falling, He's talking about the nation of Israel falling. Yes, some of the people of Israel came down to Judah and, and were in Judah. But, the, but Israel, the nation, they fell. The nation is gone. There is no nation that consisted of the, ten, uh, of the 12 tribes of Israel. The, the nation of Judah that was left, Judah alone, that was two tribes with some of these people who came down to live there but Israel, the nation, fell. And Israel, the nation, is never going to come back. That's what he's telling us here. It's going to be permanently destroyed. Now, Judah is going to come back, or Judah, it, it, there's going to be a remnant of Judah that comes back, but not of Israel. And Judah is going to come back uh, 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 kind of as a nation, uh, but Israel is not. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, verse 3, he says, For thus says the Lord God, the cities will go forth, a 1,000 strong, uh, and will have a 100 left. In other words, 90% of their army is going to be destroyed. If you get 90% of your army destroyed, what does that mean? You've lost, right? Okay, in verse 4 he says, for thus, sa for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. Who do you seek that you may live? God. Now, Jesus came and he said, Believe in me and you'll live. 
That's not the first time God said that. God has always been saying that. God has always been saying, trust me, believe in me, believe in me and you will live. How come? Well, because he loves us, but because he's the only one that has life. Life didn't start on its own. Life, there is no life outside of God. So if you're not following God, if you're following some other idols or you're following some, some scientific rule or if you're following you know, vitamins or health or whatever, if you think that's going to save you, guess what? It's not. Who's the only one that can give us life? God is. So that's why he's saying, seek me and live. Okay? Even if they die in battle, if they seek God, they will still live. Amos 5, verse 5. But do not resort to Bethel and do not go to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. So what's going to happen to Bethel? That's the capital. What's going to happen to the capital of the northern tribe? It's going to be destroyed. What's going to happen to uh, um, uh, Gilgal? It's going to be destroyed. So you, you're not going to be able to, to flee from this. Verse 6, seek the Lord that you may live, or he will break forth fi like fire on the house of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench it, uh, with none to quench it for Bethel, for uh, those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth. So he says, turn to God and live. Or you can go ahead and follow uh, Bethel. And if you do that, then you're turning justice into wormwood and, and casting down righteousness. In other words, if you follow a false God, he's not going to teach you the right thing to do. They're not going to teach you what's right. They're going to teach you what's wrong. Follow God and he'll teach you the right thing and you can live. All right. So that's where we have to stop today. So we'll start with verse 7 uh, or verse 8 next week. Okay. Amos chapter 5, verse 8. We'll start next week. Appreciate you being in class. Let's have ourselves a quick prayer. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that you have helped us to understand that not only do you work in, in the world, Father, uh, but that you care ab about the world in a spiritual way that you're more concerned about us being faithful to you and following you, Father, than you are about even our physical lives. But we pray, Father, that as we learn to become more like you, that we care more about those people who are in need, that we demonstrate our love to others by doing the things that we can do in order to relieve their afflictions and their needs. We pray that you help us to see, Father, when we are selfish or when we're materialistic or when we're turning away from you. And we thank you for all of the ways that you do that, not just through the prophets, but through the natural means that you allow to happen in the world. We pray that you help us always to turn to you because we know that you're the only one, Father, who has life and you've shared your life with us. And we pray that you would continue to share that life with us as we continually repent of our sins and believe in the forgiveness that you've offered to us in your Son, in whose name we pray, amen.